Gazzetta Football Italia. Good morning. back in England. Well, I've had a good week apart from, from the send-off on Sunday. Um, got my family out and uh, seems a not too bad atmosphere. Um, you know, like I said before, apart from the send-off, it has been a good week and uh, no doubt I'll be resting this Sunday, but I'll be telling you about that later. First, this. Coming up, Inter's battle to stay in touch with their arch-rivals Milan at the top of Serie A. James Richardson with all the news from behind the week's headlines. Your chance to see every one of last weekend's 29 goals. Serie B promotion chasers Cremonese will soon be at Wembley for the Anglo-Italian Cup final. And you can win VIP tickets for the game. All the midweek European Cup action involving Italian sides. Including another wonder goal from Jean-Pierre Papa. Paul Gascoigne takes us through his week and tells us all about that controversial sending off in general. James Richardson has been to Naples to find out what's gone wrong with the 1990 champions, and he talks to some of the club's top stars. Plus, your chance to join Gazzo, David Platt, and Des Walker as members of our new club Italian. But we start with the action. Peter Brackley reports on struggling Fiorentina against the championship chasing Inter. Dangerous ball in by Arno. Oh, Batistuta! Oh, fabulous goal! What a combination there between Baiano and Batistuta. And no wonder they're absolutely elated. That really was a stupendous goal in the sixth minute of the game. Batistuta. At last, ending his lean spell. Lupi's cross here, which Inter didn't deal with. Baiano, the back heel, Batistuta onto it in a flash and guided into the corner. Schilacci, it's a rash tackle then by Pioli. That has to be a yellow card. It was very late, sending Schilacci crashing to the turf. Gilacci threatening to go past Pioli, who lunged at him. Pretty dreadful tackle. Now Sosa. Oh! What a strike by Ruben Sosa. Goal number eight for him this season, and surely one of the best, if not the best. A thunderous drive. And nothing at all that Maragini in the Fiorentina goal could do about it. It's 1-1, 13 minutes gone. Thanks to that truly venomous effort by Ruben Sosa, almost effortless too. Schilacci, Sosa, these two diminutive strikers, creating menace all the time with their darting runs. But Sosa will certainly fancy his chances from this distance. Fiorentina with five in the wall. There's Sosa. Now there's another goal. Another brilliant goal. On from Effenberg. Driven through by Carnescioli and a goal! It came off Paganin, Karnashali shot, and an own goal right in the last few seconds has given Fiorentina an unexpected lifeline. 2-2, drama here right at the last. All the rest of the weekend goal action to come, but first, James Richardson with his weekly look behind the headlines. 
Good morning to you all. Here I am in Babington's, one of the most famous establishments in Rome, uh, right in the Piazza d'Espagna, in fact, and a regular old haunt, so I'm told, of Keats and Shelley in their Rome days. They used to pop in here for a cup of tea with, no doubt, beaded bubbles winking at the brim. I, uh, yes, I am quoting. Well, what have I brought with me here to this very temple of the poetic arts? Uh, the Gazzetta della Sport, actually. Let's not knock it, though. It has the week's big football story on the cover. Uh, Genoa, Spinelli, Torpedoes, My Freddy. The story here being that uh, My Freddy has been fired as coach of Genoa after the club's loss on Sunday to Lazio. Here's the headline in the Coriella, Spinelli eats my Freddy, although uh, disappointingly no mention inside of any fava beans and a nice Chianti. Well, meanwhile, the president has offered the vacant post to a number of coaches and received several no's. Eventually, in a move that promises economy, if nothing else, he's given the job to the ex-coach of the youth squad, Claudio Massilli. As for Gigi, my friend, well, he's probably back to his old job as a champagne salesman. He's now had three consecutive coaching blowouts. First at Juventus, where after a disastrous time, he was fired before the end of the season. Then the same thing at Bologna a year later. Now here at Genoa, just eight points made in 11 games. Uh, the team now finds themselves 16th in Serie A, with a very real possibility that they'll be relegated to Serie B in this, their centenary year. The changing coach hasn't quelled the mood of violent dissatisfaction in the town. It all started with a minor pitch invasion on Sunday, which held up the game against Lazio for three minutes. Then after that, about 200 stone-throwing fans besieged the player's coach and later set fire to another Genoa vehicle. Then on Wednesday came this, what the Gazzetta della Sport describes as the day of the invasions. A mob blocking the streets around the club's central Genoa offices, uh, calling for the resignation of the president Spinelli and lobbing the old bottle for effect as well. Well, meanwhile, because of the pitch invasion on Sunday, Genoa are receiving a day suspension from using their home stadium at Marassi. Instead, they'll be playing their next home game on neutral ground. Another person receiving a day suspension this week is our very own Paul Gascoigne. And I'd just like to mention at this point uh, the extraordinarily well-timed article written this week by the Gazzetta della Sport. Here it is, uh, all about how the referees think Gaza is a wonderful example to the other players. In Sunday morning, Gazzetta della Sport, if only they were all like Gascoigne. And here it was Sunday afternoon in Genoa. Gascoigne getting the red card and what did he think he was up to? Well, rest assured that the great man will be along shortly to fill us in, although I can only hope in the most abstract of senses only. Still, his play on Sunday, apart from the expulsion, merited copious praise in the papers on Monday, uh, inspiring as it did Riedler's two goals and Lazio's fight back from 2-0 down to their 3-2 victory. Here's the Coriella with a headline that would make even Dr. Frankenstein quiver. Uh, Riedler, the arm, Gascoigne, the brain. And uh, then continuing on the cover, the Festival of Roma. Why? Well, because while Lazio was seeing off my Freddy up in Genoa, Roma was seeing to that little old lady we used to call La Signora Juventus down here at the Stadio Olimpico. A cracking start, Roma's win over Juventus to what the papers have dubbed their 10 days of fire. A week and a half period this, in which apart from the game against Juventus, they must also face Cagliari, AC Milan in the Coppa Italia and Borussia Dortmund in the quarterfinals of the Coppa UEFA. Well, also involved in European action this week were AC Milan, and before their European Cup game against FC Porto, they announced what must be the incentive scheme to end all incentive schemes. Basically, if Milan players can manage the Grand Slam, that is, win the Supercoppa, the Coppa Italia, the Championship, and the European Cup, they will each receive a personal payment of quarter of a million pounds. That's a quarter of a million pounds per player. Well, of course, they won the Supercoppa at the start of the season. They look as though they've already got the Championship sorted out, and with their win, 1-0 over FC Porto on Wednesday night, it looks as though they're almost certainly through to the finals of the European Cup. The victory came with a spectacular goal from Jean-Pierre Papin, or strepitoso goal, as the Corriere della Sport described it. Rough translation, clamorous, tumultuous, all right, so I looked it up. The rest of the papers, though, are refreshingly simple. In the headlines, uh, Milan et voilà Papin in the Gazetta, and the Corriere's headline, Superman Papin, celebrating the Frenchman's extraordinary record of nine goals in the last six games. Well, Juventus and Parma with the other two Italian clubs involved in the European Cups this week. You can catch Strepitoso action involving them as well coming up after the break in our European Cup roundup. We'll also have our competition, of course, our regular chat with Paul Gascoigne, and our look back at last weekend's Serie A action. It's all coming up in a couple of minutes, so see you then. Welcome back. Wembley tickets to be won in our competition, but first, a roundup of Serie A goal action from Peter Brackley. Brescia in the blue shirts dominated the match from the opening whistle. Palmer were without a win in five games. Brescia have scored the fewest goals in Serie A this season. Not even Haji's shooting power could alter that statistic. Palmer almost dealt Brescia a helping hand moments later, 
But Renachoyu failed to take advantage of their charity. The third Romanian on view, Sabau, then tried his luck from long range, but the match remained goalless at half time. In the second half, Haji's shot flew past the wrong side of an upright. The away side's confidence grew as the minutes ticked by. Meli tested the goalkeeper's reflexes. And then captain Lorenzo Minotti's free kick was deflected in off the wall to give Palmer the lead 15 minutes from time. It isn't clear from the replay who got the decisive last touch. The unfortunate Haji was credited with an own goal. Brescia's hopes of an equaliser rested with Haji's trusted left foot, but Bellotta saved comfortably. Palmer winners away from home for only the second time this season. Third-placed Atalanta in white were hoping to continue their recent positive run in Canary. The Brazilian Luis Oliveira is gradually settling to life in Sardinia following an indifferent start to the season. And the former Andelec star was thwarted twice early on by Ferron in Atalanta's goal. Ferron was kept busy in the first half. Here he denies Bissoli in two attempts. Bissoli then contrived to place his own goalkeeper under threat, but Yelpo's well-timed interception kept out the rampaging Perone. Gantz couldn't convert the rebound. Canary opened the scoring 11 minutes before half-time. Capioli stylishly rounding off a delightful three-man move. Mattioli and Pescedo were both involved in the build-up. Capioli scoring his fourth goal of the season, and I doubt he'll have scored a better one than this. Atalanta replied with a late first half assault on Calories' goal. Yelpo's save from Alamao's drive was simply spectacular. The second half began with the goalkeepers once again in evidence. Ferron saving from Moriero. Moriero made his presence felt again. 20 minutes from the end, Oliveira left with the simplest of tasks to make it 2-0 to the home side. Atalanta's number two, Sergio Perini, recently called up for Italy's World Cup qualifier in Portugal, won't be too pleased with his attempts to clear the danger. Oliveira and Moriero were always a threat, but the woodwork came to Atalanta's rescue when a goal seemed certain. Then, seven minutes from full time, Perone and Rambaldi worked their way through a cluster of red and blue shirts for Perone to bring Atalanta back into the match. This was the midfielder's fourth goal of the season and well in keeping with the other outstanding goals that he's scored this term. Almost 30 years have transpired since Atalanta last won in Canary and they'll need to wait at least one more year to end their jinx. It finished 2-1 to the home side. Canary stay on course for a UEFA Cup place. Atalanta dropped to fifth. Genoa's match at home to a Lazio side, including Paul Gascoigne, was suspended for three minutes after the home fans aired their growing disenchantment with their club's recent poor form. But Genoa started the game briskly, Padovano shaving the post with this header. Lazio's fragile defence was again exposed, this time by Ruotolo, but Orsi's brave challenge foiled him. Orsi, the hero, turned villain midway through the first half. His unorthodox parry from Branco's free kick fell kindly for Padovano to score his seventh goal of the season. Lazio have made little secret of their desire to sign a new goalkeeper for the next campaign. Orsi's error will have had Dino Zoff wishing he could find one even sooner. The legendary Zoff may have already started to slip on his own gloves when a minute later, another aberration from Orsi gifted Thomas Scuravi the chance to score Genoa's second goal of the game. The veteran goalkeeper Orsi recently took over the number one jersey from Valerio Fiore. Lazio's officials will now be wondering who to turn to next. But credit Lazio with an admirable comeback. Almost immediately, Aaron Winter, who was once again in splendid form, crossed for Karl Heinz Riedler to score from close range. The two imports justified their selection ahead of the other German, Thomas Stoll, who was left watching from the stands. 
The third foreigner, of course, is Paul Gascoigne, and he had the opportunity to level the scores a minute later, but uncharacteristically squandered the chance. The Brazilian Bratko is never afraid to try his strike on goal, whatever the distance. But Orsi found goalkeeping an easier task with the use of his hands. Lazio ended the first half strongly. Luzzari's header kept up by the post. Scuravi had a glorious chance to restore Genoa's two-goal cushion in the second half, but wanted too much time. From the next attack, Lazio hit the woodwork for the second time. The unlucky man this time, Signori. But Lazio drew level midway through the second half when they were awarded a penalty for Ruotolo's brutal challenge on Gascoigne. Gazza playing a neat one-two with Crevero before dancing his way into the penalty box. Signore's successful kick brought his tally for the season to 19. Well, Gazza was soon in the thick of things again. Unfortunately, the foul on Bortolazzi earning the England man the red card. It really does seem, though, a harsh decision by the referee. And this, ironically, in the week when Gascoigne's fair play had been commended by the Italian men in black. Although reduced to ten men, Lazio pressed for the winning goal, and it arrived five minutes from time, Karl Heinz Riedler with his second of the game. Signori and Favalli carving open Genoa's defence, Riedler's goal making Dino Zoss 51st birthday one to remember. 3-2 then to Lazio, they move into third spot. Genoa's fight against relegation has only just begun. Sampdoria, without an away win since September, travelled to Milan in Italy's game of the day. The champions needed just seven minutes to open the scoring, although the goal was somewhat fortuitous. Massaro celebrates, but his strike, in fact, was deflected off Lentini en route to goal. Sampdoria rarely threatened, and when they did, Roberto Mancini was inevitably involved. His exquisite pass here releasing Busso, but play had to be brought back for Lombardo's needless challenge on the defender Costa Curta. Twenty-seven minutes in, and Milan doubled their lead through Jean-Pierre Papin. The Frenchman's finish was sheer class. Des Walker, the England defender, quite simply outwitted by the speed of Papin's reactions. Papin had previously aired his grievances exclusively to Gazzetta Football Italia earlier this month. The former European Footballer of the Year now appears to be relishing his time in Milan. Sampdoria's defence was kept under pressure in the second half too. Paliuca's fingertips keeping up Massaro's header. Papin was a constant thorn in the side of Sampdoria's defence, and on 69 minutes, he set up Lentini to score his second of the game. Lentini giving the perfect reply to his critics, who are claiming the former Torino striker is unhappy at his new club. A contender now for save of the season, Pagliuca, from Tassotti's drive. With just a minute remaining, Papin crowned his commanding performance with another truly exceptional strike. Des Walker once again dumbfounded as Papin scored his 11th goal of the season, and this in just 14 starts. 4-0 to AC Milan, they're unbeaten now in 56 Serie A games. Well, now it's competition time here on Gazzetta Football Italia, and your chance to win a trip to Wembley to see the Anglo-Italian Cup final. Just answer a simple question by ringing us on 0891 treble 3 treble 4. Cremonese have battled through the preliminary matches and will now face Derby County at Wembley on March the 27th. Both sides are currently on course for promotion, having shown some exciting attacking talents all season and some serious defensive frailties as well. Cremonese have recently experienced life in the top flight in Italy and they did it with a current Premier League player in their ranks. That man, an international forward, is now with Arsenal. So, is that former Cremonese player, A. Alan Smith, 
B. Paul Merson or C. Anders Limp. The first three correct callers picked out by our computer when lines close next Thursday go into a winner's draw for a dream trip for two to the Italian Cup Final in June. They'll also each win a pair of tickets for the Anglo-Italian Cup Final at Wembley on Saturday, March the 27th. They'll be given full VIP treatment. Five lucky runners-up win copies of the new edition of our Football Italia magazine. And there's copies of these latest Italian football fanzines for all our winners and runners-up. In Gazetta last week, we asked you to tell us who scored this second goal for Italy in their World Cup qualifier against Portugal. The answer? Pierluigi Casiraghi of Juventus. This lucky person goes into the winner's draw for a luxury trip for two to the Italian Cup final and takes home an Italian national shirt autographed by Roberto Baggio. And these five lucky runners-up get a pair of Marco Van Basten football boots. Finally, remember you can get full details of all our competitions by turning to page 365 of Fortel. Four Italian clubs win in midweek action in Europe. And just as in Italy, the land still look unbeatable. Bidding for their 63rd match in the European Cup and Italian League without defeat, they had to work hard in Portugal early on against an impressive portal side. After Albertini had tested the home goalkeeper, Bayek, the Portuguese squandered some good chances. From Timotis' free kick, Samedo headed down and watched in anguish as it bounced over Rossi and the bar. It took Marco Simoni to show how to get a shot on target. With 71 minutes gone, Milan silenced the home crowd. Jean-Pierre Papin has scored 10 goals in his last 10 games since replacing the injured Marco Van Basten. But this, his first in the Champions Cup, can hardly be better. It was a brilliant goal that even Van Basten would have been proud of. So, six points out of six now for Milan in Group B. Gothenburg beat PSV Eindhoven 3-1 to stay in second place, but it looks a vain chase for all three teams below Milan. The next fixtures in two weeks' time see Milan at home to Porto and Eindhoven visiting Gothenburg. In Group A, it's still neck and neck between Marseille and Glasgow Rangers. Rangers are at home to Bruges in a fortnight, with Marseille entertaining CSKA Moscow. In the European Cup Winners' Cup, Parma also got a good away result. A goalless draw against Sparta Prague. But it could have been even better if Thomas Brolin hadn't squandered two early chances. In the UEFA Cup, Roma kept up the Italian team's good run. But in torrential rain, it was a hard-fought match with Borussia Dortmund. In an even first half, the Germans could have taken the lead when defender Schultz got inside the area only for Cervoni to deny. On the stroke of half-time, Giannini squandered Roma's best chance. Klaus, the saviour this time. Roma put on the pressure after the interval and Carnavali sent one shot over the bar. Carnavali twice had penalty appeals turned down, but Roma got their reward after 66 minutes. A cracking shot from the edge of the area by Mihailovic leaving the Germans defenseless. Some of the gloss was taken off when Walter Bamacina got his marching orders 12 minutes from time for his second book of offense. But Roma held on to take a 1-0 lead into the second leg. Disappointingly, David Platt was left out of the Juventus side for the trip to Benfica. Coach Trapattoni, under pressure after recent failures, chose a lineup which included a fit again Julio Cesar. The largest arena in Europe was only half filled, but the home fans were given an early boost when Vito Penera eased Benfica ahead on 11 minutes after a 1 2 with Dura. The dire first half was lifted by one magical effort from Gianluca Viali, but the goalkeeper and the crossbar combined to thwart him. Juventus started the second half with a little more passion and they drew level after 58 minutes when Andy Muller was brought down by the goalkeeper Silvino. Gianluca Viali sent the keeper the wrong way to make it one all with the spot. Benfica regained the lead 15 minutes from time. Vito Panero rounded off a superb performance with his second goal of the game. 
2-1 then to the Portuguese Giants, which pleased all their fans, including the great Eusebio. Although Juve Zuego could prove decisive in the second leg in Turin. So disappointment for David Platt. But that's nothing compared to the feelings of his England teammate Paul Gascoigne, who again made the headlines last week. Let's get the Gaza view on the sending off and the rest of his views. I don't know if you've seen the, the game Lazio versus yeah, Genoa this week. It was uh, very, very entertaining for the crowd and, uh, and for Mr. Taylor, I think. Um, he came over to watch the game. It went two down in the first couple of minutes. Um, setting off, you know, off obviously wasn't too happy, but um, Real got a, an early goal back, which uh, lifted us a bit for the setting off. Setting off come and uh, the lads played very, very well. We really battled on well, um, really fought well, and uh, I played a one two and I got the penalty. But um, I don't know if you've seen what happened uh, about ten minutes after that. Um, I was given my first red card in Italy um, in front of Mr. Mr. Tiola. Um, the thing is, well, if you see the incident there, uh, I don't think it was harsh as it looked. Uh, I think I was unfortunate or fort fort sorry, fortunate to get sent off. Um, I didn't really make contact with the guys, especially what people were saying. Um, you know, the old uh, Gascoigne's future in doubt again. I think I haven't done too bad considering what people expect of me. Red card every week. First red card in uh, was it, seven months or something, so I'm really pleased. Uh, not to get the red card, but um, you know, control myself. And even though the referee said that he would have, uh, I think another few seconds more, he would have fouled him. Um, but this is it, Lee. Uh, we all know how, how they are. And uh, I have to hold my hand up, accept it, give him the red card and just get on with it. I'm suspended for one game, which is against Palmer, um, tomorrow. And uh, let's hope the lads can keep on uh, winning because uh, we're up there when the, you know, we're not far behind the, the second point, I think. Um, obviously, Mil Milan are storming ahead, but uh, UEFA is very important for us, and let's hope we can carry on, keep on battling and getting the points. If you have a look at the sending off, um, the guy who I actually had the tussle with was the guy that uh, whacked me knee in the first game against Genoa, uh, which I had to come off just after half time. Um, the guy obviously did do a lot of pulling shirts and all that, and uh, I think I overacted a little bit by uh, putting my hand in front of his chest and pulling him down. Like, um, I mean, I don't think I deserve the uh, the red card for it, but this is it, Lee, and that's the way they are. I just have to get on with the next step, this. Um, but no doubt you'll have your own judge on it. You know, I was really pleased after uh, my performance against San Marino and the Taylor come out. So Mr. Taylor come out and watch the game. Uh, you know, my fitness has risen. Um, I feel really fit now. Um, I've done a two and a half weeks of real solid hard work. Um, and I was really pleased to see him there, you know. Um, that you could even actually witness the, the sending off, um, which was, I wouldn't like to see him read it in the papers. Um, you know, the, hearing their story and without him being there, and he is then, so everything was okay. And uh, to be fair, I'm just really looking forward to even to the next England game where I can obviously hopefully put things right. I mean, one bad game is not too bad, is it? My dad and mum's coming to see us, uh, it's the family for uh, 10 days. And uh, my dad drove all the way from uh, from uh, England and you wouldn't believe what he brought me. I mean, he's really serious as well. My dad brought a spaghetti, so I need some pasta and so to build up my energy. And this spaghetti special because it's from Dunstan where I was born. It's not really bad, is it? Spaghetti all the way from Dunstan, can you really believe it? Travelled, you know, 3,000 miles. And he's brought us spaghetti. I mean, I didn't get a hug or nothing, just spaghetti. Never mind. I'll eat that later. Anyway, bye bye for now. Welcome back. News of the launch of our Club Italia coming up, but first, let's complete the goal action from Serie A. Napoli in the blue shirts faced Ancona at their San Paolo Stadium, and after De Chari almost gave the visitors a shock lead, it was Antonio Carreco, the Brazilian star, who spurned a gilt-edged opportunity for the home side. 
from the resulting corner, Policano will feel he should have done better. And Kona's left back, Lorenzini, then won this 50 metre dash with Kripa. But there was no one at the far post to convert the cross. At the other end, Kareka then brought out the best from goalkeeper Nista. Napoli continued to surge forward in the second half. Fonseca leading the charge. An obvious dive by Policano. Amazingly, the former Torino man maintained afterwards he'd been tripped. No penalty given. But Napoli were unfortunate not to be awarded a penalty later in the game. Fonseca, in the centre of your picture, did seem to be held back. Mauro's glancing header then just went wide of the post. All this before De Chari gave Ancona a brief respite as they launched a rare but fruitless counter-attack. Kripa's tame header brought down the closing curtain. Napoli's second consecutive goal is draw sees them drop one place to 12. A Roma goalkeeper now with Juventus was also keen to impress. Roma started briskly. Here's Giannini firing high and wide. Roma, unbeaten in the last five league matches, held the upper hand. Rizzatelli twice stretching Juve's defence. For all Roma's enterprise, though, Rappel has been in scintillating form since his return from injury back in January. Finally rewarded on 56 minutes. Giannini, the scorer. Nine Juventus players in the penalty box failed to stop Roma's captain claiming his sixth goal of the season. Piacentini then began a procession of shots on Juve's goal. His first effort saved by Poruzzi. A second from Piacentini flew right across the face of the goal. Poruzzi in brilliant form then denied Mikhailovic. But he could do little to stop little Thomas Hessler with this stunning strike. It was sweet revenge for the German international, who of course was discarded by Juventus back in 1991. Juve then had their second penalty appeal turned down after Roberto Baggio was sent tumbling. And right at the end, Chavone ensured a Roma victory, his save keeping out England's David Platt. Juventus haven't won away from Turin now for almost five months. Pescara in the blue and white striped shirts were thrashed 7-0 the last occasion they visited Torino and there were a goal down here after only five minutes. Carlos Aguilera started and finished the move to score his first goal since November. Alferi fails to make contact with the ball. Enzo Schifo's first time pass finished with power and precision by the Uruguayan international Aguilera. Sliskovic should have levelled the scores for Pescara, but his shot lacked accuracy. Torino then extended their lead on 19 minutes. Gianluca Sordo's seemingly powder puff shot ending up in the back of Pescara's net. Marchioro, the goalkeeper on loan from Torino's fierce rivals Juventus, will be feeling then doubly disappointed. Pescara, though, pulled a goal back four minutes later through Nobile. Once again, the goalkeeper appears to be caught by surprise, this time Marche Gianni. The Torino keeper, though, redeemed himself with this save from Massara. Then Aguilera tested Marchioro's reflexes from distance. And Campagno had the last effort of the first half for Pescara. Torino started the second half in the same way they began the first, with a goal. Aguilera releasing Casagrande, the Brazilian international, for goal number three. Pescara's failure to perfect the offside trap, allowing Casagrande to score for the first time since September. BV went close for Pescara as the game, like the weather, deteriorated. Pescara have now lost their last nine away matches, while Torino's revival continues. They're now in fourth place. And finally to Udinese in the black and white striped shirts against Foggia. It was Foggia who took the lead after 37 minutes, albeit in comical fashion. Seno's miscue guided in for an own goal by Daisy Derry. 
The former Roma and Inter player was unfortunate, but he would ultimately have the last word. Francesco Del Anno is a player to watch out for in Serie A and is already being lined up for one of Italy's glamour clubs. His fine solo run checked by the right boot of Bianchini for a penalty. His pace simply too much for the Foggia defenders. Abel Balbo makes no mistake from the penalty spot to make it 1-1 on the stroke of half-time. The former Argentinian international is now an Italian citizen. And with goals like this coming up, well, he may find a future place in Arrigo Saki's squad. Balbo has 18 goals for the season, and a transfer to a bigger club is now assured. Foggia equalised five minutes later when their two imports, Brian Roy and Igor Kolivanov, combined. Kolivanov's finish was exemplary. It was only his second goal of the season, but one that he'll savour for a long time to come. The Dutch international Brian Roy could have made it 3-2, but somehow sliced his shot wide. An Udinese chance then, Del Anno's shot saved by Mancini. An eventful match, even the referee got in on the act with a perfectly timed slide tackle on Biagioni. This enthralling match had one final twist when up popped own goal victim Stefano Desideri to score a last minute winner. Perhaps the result was a little harsh on Foggia, but nonetheless, Stacey Derry's first goal for his new club couldn't have been more dramatically timed. Udinese ease their relegation fears and move now into mid-table. Despite losing Paul Gascoigne, Lazio still made up a point on Inter thanks to their win at Genoa. Torino stay four, but Atalanta dropped two places to fifth. The bottom four remain unchanged, but several other clubs are in danger, including, amazingly enough, Napoli in 12th place. So what's gone wrong at San Paolo Stadium? Seen that so many triumphs, including championship wins in 1987 and 1990, James Richardson travels south to investigate. A snow-capped Mount Vesuvius overlooks the Bay of Naples, a majestic view of a city that, after all, has a royal past, capital as it was, of the Kingdom of Two Sicilies until the unification of Italy back in 1860. Nowadays, Napoli still retains that fierce spirit of independence and enjoys also a reputation as a world capital of chaos. However, despite having still one of the Mediterranean's biggest ports, it's in serious economic trouble, with close to a fifth of its population unemployed. If Naples is a city struggling in the shade of its former glories, then that's a pretty apt metaphor as well for its football club, Napoli. Just three years on from their last Italian championship, the club now finds itself three points off the relegation zone in Serie A. All right, so they don't have Maradona anymore, but neither did they have him last year, and then they managed a very respectable fourth in the division. This year, they were meant to challenge for even higher honours, but instead the club has fallen as low as second last in the division. They've fired one of their coaches. They've even been physically assaulted by their own fans. What on earth is going on? in Naples. È difficile così dare una, dare una spiegazione a quanto ci è successo a noi, anche perché eh, il, il Napoli era una squadra che quest'anno era stata costruita per, per lottare e per, per essere tra le prime sia in Italia che in Europa. Era stata costruita eh, così sull'esperienza del campionato scorso che era stato positivo quest'anno si, si è cercato di fare dei correttivi e si sperava che, che questi correttivi portassero la squadra a fare meglio questo purtroppo non è successo non è successo la musica brasiliana più forte di tutti after a passing Correcca had proved it's not all glum faces at Napoli, Zola had another go at explaining. Prima di tutto, cioè, oltre che la squadra, bisogna avere anche la motiv le motivazioni, bisogna avere la grinta, mm. la carica. Quest'anno evidentemente non ci è mancato questo. Non so da che cosa possa dipendere, non, non ho idea. 
The club reckon they knew, though. With last year's team spirit in tatters, they put the blame on former wonder coach Claudio Ranieri, a coach they said inexperienced to the demands of a season with Coppa Italia, Coppa UEFA and Championship, and unable to snap the players out of their downward spiral because he was too close to them. After Napoli's 5-1 home defeat by AC Milan, Ranieri was fired and replaced by Ottavio Bianchi, the man who led Napoli to their last Italian Championship. Among the fans around town, meanwhile, the issue of where the guilt lies gets a divided response. Ma diciamo che soprattutto il colpevole è la società. Perché? Perché non c'è molta serietà come come società. Non è a livello di di club come Milan, Juventus che a livello organizzativo sono sono del tutto differenti dal Napoli. Come sembra quest'anno solo Fonseca, ma solo Fonseca ha giocato qualche volta Careca, ma solo loro due giocano. Cioè gli altri che e fanno? La squadra, che... la squadra, la squadra che deve essere unita. Bene, gli allenatori, anche. allenatori, c'è cioè, stato tutto. Ma io penso un po' tutto <ride> lo staff eh, che non va molto no, bene, il giocatore, la società. Bo... E poi i giocatori non hanno proprio voglia di, 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 di giocare al pallone. No, non è questo. Sì, non è che si mescia. No, no, non è questo. Come? Perché gli abbonati e fa un Napoli, ma lascia, per il risultato non ce l'abbiamo. Si assomiglia molto come tifoseria eh, napoletana con, con quella brasiliana. È una tifoseria molto molto calda, poi non è anche una città di mare, è una città calda che, che vive da, da lunedì a lunedì, vive il calcio. Well, Napoli's fans are famous throughout the country and probably the world for their spirit. But as the bombs some of them put under President Ferleno's house back in 1983 demonstrates, they disgruntle easily. Already by week eight of this season, fans were rioting and burning seats at the San Paolo in protest. And worse was still to come. A few days after Bianchi's arrival, the anger of the fans here boiled over. About 20 or so masked Napoli fans broke into this Socavo training ground over that fence at the rear. Uh, armed with chains and bats, they attacked the players while they were in the middle of their afternoon training session, severely injuring some of them, notably Corradini. Zonola, mysteriously enough, was spared by the group. The message of the fans was clear enough. Bianchi break the players' backs. For them, the problems of the season lay entirely with a slack squad. Un'esperienza brutta, ecco, purtroppo eh, non pensavo che, eh, non avrei mai pensato che si sarebbe arrivato a tanto. Eh, comunque preferisco pensare che è stata l'azione, l'azione di, 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 di alcuni, alcuni, non saprei come definirli, persone che non hanno, effettivamente non hanno una grossa intelligenza perché con il loro atto non hanno, sicuramente non hanno fatto del bene alla squadra, non hanno fatto del bene alla città. It certainly was an extraordinary start for new coach Ottavio Bianchi. Luckily though, he's a man more than used to life in Naples. Bianchi was the man who with Maradona took Napoli to two Scudettos and a UEFA Cup between 1986 and 1990, but who was pushed out after bitter rows by President Ferleno because of a Maradona-led players' rebellion. Io sono andato via tre anni fa e non pensavo che per almeno per un po' di tempo io potessi ritornare a Napoli. Non avevo la volontà di ritornare a Napoli perché io a Napoli son, mi sono sempre trovato bene, ho lavorato bene, però dopo un po' ci possono essere dei problemi ed è giusto che ognuno prenda la propria strada. Bianchi was helped to overcome his reluctance, firstly by a three quarters of a million pound a year contract from President Ferlena and secondly his desire to help his old club in trouble. Io sono molto legato a questa città e poi con il Presidente, malgrado in certe occasioni abbiamo delle, delle, vediamo le cose in maniera diversa, però c'è sempre stato stima e, e rispetto reciproco e allora mi è stato chiesto di venire ad aiutare e l'ho fatto molto volentieri. Things have certainly improved dramatically since Bianchi's arrival. However, the problems remain as demonstrated by last Sunday's draw in what should have been one of the schedule's easiest games at home to Ancona. A game which confirmed Gianfranco Zola's importance to the side and a game which saw Fonseca whistled at the San Paolo for the first time. E abbiamo delle partite con degli alti e bassi di rendimento. Specialmente troviamo difficoltà quando giochiamo con le squadre piccole dove non eh, entriamo nella stessa ordine di idee, non abbiamo la stessa determinazione, la stessa... Eh, in parole povere pensiamo ancora di essere grandi e non lo siamo. Ma comunque domenica scorsa contro l'Ancona abbiamo sofferto anche un po' perché ci ha mancato Sola che è quello che, che ci può dare l'assist dei gol, il passaggio dei gol, quindi ci ha mancato quelle, eh, quell'ossigeno che a noi, a noi attaccanti ci serve, se non abbiamo qualcuno che sicuramente ci dà un bel pallone o qualcosa è difficile da segnare. 
Fonseca hasn't had a goal for the last four games, but he remains the club's top scorer. His season and Napoli's got off to a spectacular start in the early UEFA rounds when he scored all five of Napoli's goals away at Valencia. While Napoli's resulting reputation turned out to be wildly exaggerated, Fonseca himself has, at least until the recent dry spell, been the one Napoli element to live up to its promise. Fonseca represents a vital building block for next season's Napoli. By and large, the club's economics rule out any large-scale purchases this summer, but they are willing to make a special exception in the case of the £8 million Aristo Stoichkov. 47 goals in three seasons and a European Cup winner with Barcelona. The same club Maradona came from, Stoichkov wants to come to Italy and has declared Napoli his dream team. Unofficially, the club is confident a deal can be done, but in the meantime, Napoli have to get through the rest of this season. Well, what Napoli hope will be the next stage on their road to recovery will come tomorrow afternoon at the Stadio degli Alpi against Juventus, a match which Napoli haven't won since the Maradona days. It's a curious game, one which pits together two of Serie A's most disappointing sides this season, two sides with a lot of ground still to make up. Now remember, there's no live game here tomorrow on Channel 4, but we will bring you highlights of this match in next week's show. Milan fans will be looking for another goal feast when they entertain Fiorentina. Remember, it was 7-3 to the champions in October. Genoa and Ancona shared eight goals that day, Lazio and Parma seven, while Udinese beat Pescara 5-2. All the goals from those return matches in Gazetta next week. But now, something completely different. And it's news of how you can get even closer to life in Serie A. That's by joining our brand new Club Italia. Our first three honorary members, none other than Paul Gascoigne, David Platt and Des Walker. Become a member and here are the benefits. For starters, you'll receive a Club Italia sports bag, a Club Italia cap, edition two of the new Football Italia magazine, a Serie A full color wall chart, a members only lapel bag, and a monthly newsletter going right behind the scenes of Italian football. In addition, members will get discounts worth over 150 pounds from a whole range of goods, including Football Italia videos, football trainers, soccer sweaters, books, Italian holidays, plus specially designed computer software covering Italian football, facts, figures and personalities. Just call the membership hotline on 0891 treble 5 123 for full details. And join Gaza, David Platt and Des Walker as part of the Italian in crowd. And that's it for today. No game on Channel 4 tomorrow, but we're back with Gazetta Football Italia next Saturday morning, and that will include a full preview of our next live match, Lazio against AC Milan. Join us for that.